Aloha and good morning, and welcome to the Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection. And I'm joined uh, this morning by the Committee on uh, Energy, Energy Economic, Economic uh, Development. Development and Technology. And Tourism. Tourism, okay. I always think of uh, Senator Wakai as technology. So uh, we have a number of items on our agenda. Before we get started, there are some housekeeping announcements uh, that I am uh, required to provide. Um, this meeting is being live streamed on YouTube. In the unlikely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to technical difficulties, the committee will reconvene, the committees will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business uh, tomorrow morning in conference room uh, 229, uh, tomorrow being uh, the 9th, February the 9th, and at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. And a public notice will be uh, posted on the legislature's website. For testifiers who are participating remotely, your audio will be muted and video disabled until shortly if, before it is your turn to testify. Um, I'll be going down a list of individuals who've submitted written testimony for each measure. We apologize if the closed captioning doesn't accurately transcribe the names. Uh, if you are interested in reviewing the written testimony, please go to the legislature's website where you will find a link on the status page for each measure. And we are also joined uh, here in conference room 229 by Senator Joy San Juan Ventura. And on the Zoom, we have uh, Vice Chair for the uh, committee on uh, CPN, Senator uh, Stanley Chang. We also have Senator Kurt Favello, who gets to serve on every committee he likes uh, in, the, in the Senate. Uh, we have Senator Riviere, who is on uh, my committee as well. Senator uh, Linda Coit and Senator Clarence Nishihara just joined us. Uh, Senator Mizalucha is here. Senator Joy. Sandwood Ventura is here, and I think we are ready to proceed. Are we ready, members? Yes. Okay. The first item on our joint agenda this morning is Senate Bill 3023 relating to real estate brokers. It prohibits real estate brokers and agents licensed in the state from advertising, often to rent, receiving any remuneration for, or representing illegal transient vacation units and whole home short-term rentals. Requires the Real Estate Commission to amend its rules accordingly no later than December 31, 2022. And our first testifier uh, via Zoom is the Real Estate Commission. And I believe Michael Pang is going to deliver the testimony. Michael, are you there? Not present, Chair. Sure. Okay, he um, supports the intent of the measure and offers some comments. Uh, Hawaii's thousand friends, Tom Kaufman, testimony and support. Livable Hawaii Kai, Dylan Ramos, testimony and support. We have some late testimony from Popo Lao Wailua Alliance in support. Uh, and another testifier, uh, Angela uh, Huntimer, who is also a member of the Ko'olau Wailua Allowance Testimony and Support. We have a list of individuals. I will read their name. All of these individuals are submitted supportive testimony. Neil Frazier, Chuck Prentice, Denise Bolsbert, Karen, uh, Karen Gallagher, Marjorie Irway, Kim Jorgensen, uh, John Thielst, uh, and I apologize if I'm butchering your names, uh, Karen Simmons, Heidi Cruel, uh, late testimony submitted by Janine Johnson, Eileen McKee, uh, also testimony in opposition from Edward Jones, late testimony from uh, in support from Larry uh, McElhinney, uh, late testimony in opposition, Marty Martins. Late testimony in support from Save North Shore Neighborhoods, Kathleen Kainui. Late testimony from Unite Here Local 5. Um, 
Ann Joyner in support, Max Toey in support, uh, Lavani Lipton in support, and Local 5 was in support as well. That is all the testimony that we have. I don't see anybody on the call who could answer questions, but I will ask if there are questions from members. Seeing none, let's go down. Oops, we got a little too far here. Um, let's go down to the next measure, which is Senate Bill 2513. This is relating to renewable energy requires the Public Utilities Commission to have electric utilities separately issue requests for proposals for firm renewable energy generation and requests for proposals for intermittent renewable gener energy generation. Prohibits the Public Utilities Commission from approving any new or renewed utility-owned generation project by a public utility or any new or renewed power purchase agreement for electricity generation with affiliated interest with the public utility, appropriates money. We have testimony uh, from Dean Nishina, Executive Director of the Department of uh, DCCA's Division of Consumer Advocacy. Dean, are you on the call? Yes, I am. Good morning and aloha, Chair Baker, uh, Vice Chairs and members of the committees. Um, my name is Dina Sheen. I'm with the Division of Consumer Advocacy. You have our written testimony offering comments on the bill. I am available for questions, if any. Thank you. Okay, thank you for joining us. Uh, we also have testimony, I believe, on Zoom from the Hawaii State Energy Office. Kristen Baumgart Turner and Maria Tomei. Yes. Ladies, are you here? Yes, we are. Thank you. Aloha, Chairs Baker and Wakai. Uh, Vice Chairs Chang and Misalucha, members of the committees. The Hawaii State Energy Office offers comment on SB 2513, which I believe you have. I do want to mention that we appreciate the intent of the bill to improve the reliability and the resilience when fossil fuel power, power plants are retired and to simplify the evaluation process for their replacement. Um, prohibiting, however, either firm or intermittent resources from a solicitation may disallow cost-effective hybrids and new or timely technologies. We also want to bring attention to regarding the definition of firm renewable energy in Section 2 of the bill. HSEO notes that a strict or narrow reading of the language, subject only to, may be interpreted to exclude those that are subject to the availability and receipt of certain inputs like fuels for their operation, including the availability of fuel would broaden the definition to clearly include those resources, if that is the legislature's intent. intent. Um, HSEO defers to the appropriate agencies on the topic of the utility power procurements. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and we are here to answer questions, mahalo. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Public Utilities Commission, Chair Jay Griffin. Uh, Vice Chairs and members of the committees, uh, you have our written testimony offering comments. I just want to highlight a few areas, uh, and, and the, our concerns uh, primarily re relate to Section 2. And so on the first part, you have our testimony. Uh, this bill would require us to separate RFPs into so-called firm and variable. And what you see in our testimony is that this would actually impede our progress towards emerging best practices in the industry. And those Merging best practices are to do what are called all source procurements. And so in this instance, in, in that setup, utility identifies what they need in the future for their, for their elect to run their electric grid reliably, and then allow a variety of different competing sources, both from the supply side, also from the demand side to compete over uh, the ability to provide those services. And you select the best options out of that. So that will, over time address uh, new, as new technologies emerge and become more cost effective that opens the door for them. What is being proposed here actually impedes our progress to do that. And if you look at the report that we cite as well as the consumer advocate from the regulatory assistance project in Rocky Mountain Institute, and these are two in, uh, a nonprofit or organizations that advise uh, regulatory commissions across the United States and around the world. Uh, they recommend that you actually put into statute to do all source procurement. This would take us a step backwards uh, and, and prohibit us from moving that direction. So 
Uh, we can address further questions on that section. Uh, so we recommend uh, removing that section uh, from the measure if it was to move forward. The next session, the next uh, part of that section talks about self-build and affiliate related uh, projects from the utility or the or affiliates. Uh, I want to very importantly note that the preamble talks about um, violation, potential violations of the code of conduct that have occurred. The commission has investigated those and there were remedial actions taken. Nonetheless, it does highlight the challenge that we all have uh, when the utility can both compete in these solicitations or their affiliates, the commissions identified that in the past. We expend significant resources to hire an independent observer to oversee all these solicitations um, and, and uh, uh, keep a level playing field. Um, and so we have seen, I think, a fairly robust competition in the two uh, solicitations that have just occurred. And despite that, you know, the commission has recognized this as a as a problem in the past. Um, but we identify areas in here if we were to have an outright prohibition on utility owned projects or affiliates, we see um, potential limitations that we may need in the future. So, uh, so we're not recommending an outright uh, prohibition, but there may be certain instances um, for what we uh, term greenfield projects. And so uh, I'm available for any questions. Um, ha happy to discuss these aspects of the measure any further. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We also have testimony and support from Practical Policy Institute of Hawaii, Brian Barbata. Is Brian on the call? Testimony and support. We have testimony in opposition from 350 Hawaii, Sherry Pollock. Uh, from Hawaiian Electric, Rebecca Deha. Matsushima, is Rebecca on the call? I am. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chairs, and members of the committees. My name is Rebecca Day of Matsushima, and I am testifying on behalf of Hawaiian Electric in opposition to SB 2513. Hawaiian Electric opposes the language prohibiting the PUC from approving any new or renewed utility-owned generation project or um, any new or renewed power purchase agreements for electricity generated by an affiliate. Um, for the reasons noted in my written testimony, which are too numerous to go through in detail today. However, I would like to point out that there are many existing safeguards and processes already in place to ensure fair competition and that removing um, the option for utility or affiliates to seek approval of new or renewed projects would have devastating negative impacts on the state's ability to meet its renewable energy goals in a timely and cost-effective manner would result in the loss of local jobs and would increase the need to use undeveloped land to site future renewable energy projects. This bill would effectively prohibit the utility from repurposing any of our own existing electrical generation facilities to use any type of other fuel source, including renewable fuels. This would mean less options for the development of firm renewables, forcing more dependence upon greenfield projects that would add community impacts, compete for lands, and require additional compliance with the RPS law and additional transmission infrastructure would need to be built. Um, additionally, not renewing existing renewable energy projects would waste established resources already approved by the Public Utilities Commission and increase the likelihood of placing the burden of stranded asset costs on our customers. We thank you for the opportunity to testify today and I'm here to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much. We have uh, Tahori Power LLC offering some comments is sandy Wong. yes i see yes. sandy there yes i'm here chair baker good morning um nice to see all of you do you realize that you're all wearing green that yes. in the room <laughs> i know and yes it wasn't <laughs> planned at all yeah but you uh, like the memo. Like. um so anyway, good morning my name is sandy wong i'm testifying in, in behalf of tahiri power uh we submitted comments because we oppose portions of this bill and we support other portions of this bill. Um, like Chair Griffin, uh, we agree that the state would be taking a step backwards if we did not do all source RFPs and instead did what the bill is calling for and doing separate RFPs for firm and separate RFPs for intermittent. Um, I would go a step further to also say that by doing 
separate RFPs, you're really doing a disservice to the ratepayers because you're not ensuring that they are going to get the best deal. Basically, by doing separate RFPs, you basically cut off half of the competition already. Um, so I would ask that if you do move this bill forward, that that section two be removed. Uh, we do support um, the section of the bill that would prohibit um, affiliate transactions. Um, I think the preambles did a good job of setting out um, the things that can occur when you have affiliate transactions. And also, I think for public confidence, we should get rid of that. So I'm available for questions, and it's been nice to see all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, we have testimony in opposition from IBEW Local 1260. Anybody on the call from IBEW? We also have testimony in support from Hawaii Clean Power Alliance, Frederick Reddle. Frederick on the call. Testimony in opposition uh, from Richard Walsgrove. Testimony in opposition from John Kawamoto. Uh, thank John, you. I believe I see you. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Kawamoto, and I'm in opposition to this bill. There was an op-ed in the Star Advertiser yesterday about firm energy, which includes the burning of trees, which is a dirty source of energy, even dirtier than coal. The burning of trees emits more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than burning coal to produce an equivalent amount of energy. So that's one shortcoming of the bill. Another shortcoming is that it hamstrings the PUC. The PUC shouldn't be limited in its efforts to protect the public. Furthermore, the narrative in section one of the bill talks about the code of conduct, but the narrative can't make up its mind about whether there was an actual breach of the code of conduct or whether it was only a perceived breach. In either case, the substantive portion of the bill in section two does nothing to fix the code of conduct or how it is implemented. And for the foregoing reasons, I oppose the bill. Mahalo for your kind attention. Thank you, John. We also have a Zoom testimony in opposition from Tom. Dr. Tom Keeney. Is Tom on the, on the Zoom? If not, members, we have the testimony. Are any, are there any questions for any of our testifiers? Senator Mizzalucha? Uh, Jay Griffith, please, do you see? Yes, my chair. So, Jay, um, in your testimony, you indicated that you acknowledged that the intent of the bill is a, a positive one, that it's to improve competition, but you alluded to some unintended consequences. Would you kindly elaborate on that? Sure, I, I think that's, that's exactly that, but we, we strongly support competition, and that's why on the uh, topic of the, all, of the separating the procurements, we've been working the direction of increasing competition by increasing the number of providers and, and technology types. Um, so by restrict, by separating them, um, that is, is, um, uh, Ms. Wong said you cut out half the field kind of by, by design. Okay, um, so it's, it's, it's exactly what Ms. Wong was saying. Is there anything else that we're not getting? Well, I think, and then on the, the second part, the self build, and affiliate uh, affiliate related uh, affiliate either affiliate relations or affiliate projects those are additional competitors I think again the challenge is that you have uh, the utility writing this writing the solicitation with the commission's oversight and input conducting it with our oversight and input but you have you know one team within the company competing to win as well uh, so it it creates I mean it, it creates a lot of challenge for us I think we have done our best in managing that. But I think to fully take that off the table will limit important potential cost-effective options into the future. Um, and I think to uh, Ms. Matsa, uh, Rebecca said as much, and I think we, we concur with some of those parts and I believe Dean Machine and his testimony pointed out as well. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Members, any other questions? If not, thank you all very much. Let's move forward to the next item on our agenda. We're going from an energy source to a different kind of 
So our Senate Bill 3025 is relating to digital currency licensing program. This creates a licensing scheme for digital currency companies to be regulated by the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs Division of Financial Institutions, continues the study of use cases by the Hawaii Technology Development Corporation or appropriates funds. Our first testifier is Iris Decada, Commissioner of DFI. Good morning, Iris. Hi, good morning. And um, thank you for hearing these bills. So my name is Iris Ikeda, and I am the commissioner for the Division of Financial Institutions, Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. And we have been conducting a study with the Hawaii T Technology Development Corporation um, called the Digital Currency Innovation Lab, where we invited uh, companies to offer transactions to consumers. After the first year of our research project, we um, drafted some new a new piece of legislation after we um, thought that there might be some regulation that's needed in this area. We did solicit feedback from a bunch of um, different stakeholders, including consumers, businesses, folks in our um, participating in the DCIL, and we had several drafts that were sent out for comment. And each draft was a little bit different after um, reviewing and considering the comments from the different stakeholders. Um, this particular bill is one of the earlier iterations of the of what is finally known as our department bill or our administration bill, which is Senate Bill 3076. So we would prefer um, our administration bill. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. We have Hawaii Technology Development Corporation, Lynn Higashi. Aloha chairs, vice chairs, members of the committee, Len Higashi, Hawaii Technology Development Corporation. Um, as Iris mentioned, HTDC has partnered with DFI on this digital currency uh, innovation lab. We believe that digital currency offers uh, interesting economic development opportunities here in Hawaii and <clears throat> recognize that uh, it, its activities cannot move forward without enabling legislation this session. So we appreciate you hearing this bill. We stand on our testimony and support. Thank you. Thank you. Grassroots Institute of Hawaii, Joe Kent. Aloha chair and committee members. My name is Joe Kent and I'm the executive vice president of the Grassroots Institute of Hawaii. Uh, respectfully, we believe that SB 3025 has overly st stiff regulations that could cement Hawaii for decades to come as one of the worst states for cryptocurrency. We're, we're already the worst uh, if you measure it by how many companies don't want to come here or have left us. Uh, but this bill, um, the licensure bill could actually make it even worse than that. Um, and not to mention the bill is also unclear. Uh, my testimony uh, outlines a lot of things that need to be clarified. For example, it's unclear whether food establishments would need a license to accept cryptocurrency or other establishments. Um, the tangible net worth requirement is unclear. The bill never defines exactly what the tangible net worth requirement is. Um, and the calculation for the tangible net worth requirement is, um, is also unclear and would require excessive amounts of cash as a buffer. Um, it's also not clear whether customers would need to be licensed or not. And also the bill has a lot of undue surveillance, state surveillance requirements over customers' finances. Um, and this could create a honeypot for hackers and Hawaii doesn't have a good track record for not being hacked. Uh, so the bottom line is this bill could prevent locals from engaging in this emerging market and diversifying our economy. Um, and again, we're already the worst state. Um, let's lift the regulations to help us become better. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go to the next uh, testifier, the Libertarian Party of Hawaii, Dina Bonoan. I don't see anybody. Ryan Ozawa, Hawaii Hui. And we'll welcome uh, 
the chair of EET to join us. He was uh, taking care of some other important business that was scheduled before we had this hearing. So good to see you, Glenn. Thanks for having me. Um, you didn't get the memo on the green. I know. Sorry. <laughs> oh, this is the girls' decision. Okay. Our next testifier on Senate Bill 3025 is Jared Gerard Silva in opposition. Katie Jackson in opposition. We have Spencer Toyama in support. Glenn Pablo in support. Late testimony in support from Trung Lam and late testimony in support from Stacy Sugai. Is there anybody else on the call that I missed calling? If not, members, any questions? Senator Mizalucha. Oh, for Iris Ikeda, please. Iris, are you still there? There she is. Okay, Iris. So um, at yesterday's hearing, I was surprised to hear about the statistics. Like, 61,000 investors from Hawaii, unique investors, and about a, a billion, you said, right, in transactions. Mm -hmm. So certainly, you know, I think crypto uh, commerce is, is something that we need to regulate. But one of the things that, I, that, that jumped out at me in reading some of the testimonies is that the way the bill is written, the cost to obtain a license could be anywhere from a hundred thousand to a million. Isn't that like a barrier to entry? And could you address that? Is that is that about the what you have found in your? I know you were looking at other states as well. What is the prevailing? Um, okay, this is not a, the the bill we're, that you're referencing is not an admin bill. Yeah. Okay. But okay, I guess we're, we're, uh, my question will be for the next bill then. Well, you can ask it on this one and Iris can comment yeah. if she likes, but I just wanted to point out that the bill that we've just gone through is not an admin bill. Yeah, okay. And I guess it's in the testimony though. Yeah. It's, it's in Kate Jackson's testimony, if you take a look at it, that she pointed out that the cost to obtain a license is a um, hundred K to a million. So I was like, aghast by that number. So if you can kind of address that. Yes, thank you. So I, I have not read her testimony, but um, the application fee is um, nine, set at $9,000, which is um, probably one of the highest in the state. But as I said, this is a brand new um, licensing scheme. Um, and it's actually based off of what we have learned from the DCIL, the Digital Currency Innovation Lab. I'm not sure where those numbers come from. Um, the annual renewal fee is capped at $50,000. Okay. okay, we have a, we have another bill. Yeah. So let's go to that bill and uh, sure. see uh, the differences because the next bill is Senate Bill 3076, relating to special purpose digital currency licensure. This is governor's package bill. So this would be Iris's bill. So, okay. Uh, why don't you start us off with your testimony, Iris? Okay, thank you. Yes, so I know it's a little bit confusing and I think that's because we sent out so many drafts and um, a lot of the companies I think might have been confused um, with many of the drafts that we sent out. So anyway, this is our admin bill and my name is Iris Ikeda. I'm the commissioner for the Division of Financial Institutions, Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. So this proposed bill is a licensing scheme to license digital currency companies. As we learned during the um, Digital Currency Innovation Lab, which is our study, uh, we believe that there um, needs to be a licensing scheme for these digital currency companies. These companies, as we learned in the DCIL, are not doing strictly money transmission. There is aspects of money transmission. There's some aspects of securities, um, of banking, of lending, of, you know, a whole, um, whole uh, lot of different uh, activities that could go on. Um, so anyway, this, this bill is just purely a licensing scheme for the companies. If the bill is enacted, this would be the first um, licensing structure of its kind. And what it does is it blended aspects of other states' as laws, which haven't quite worked. Um, I think you've heard, um, reference to New York's bit license. It has some problems. I only took portions of that particular law 
Um, Wyoming has a bank charter, which has does not have any banks currently chartered. Um, and so, you know, just taking parts of it that I think would be um, necessary for safety and soundness and provide for consumer protection. So the proposal is centered on consumer protection, as is all of our other um, industries that we regulate, as these transactions have proven popular in our research study in the DCIL. Um, we actually, um, you know, we I believe that this is really a work in progress, um, and we have been continuously meeting with different stakeholders um, throughout the drafting of this bill. And I would like to propose two um, amendments to this bill, um, although it didn't make it into our testimony because our meeting was um, yesterday. Um, we have a typo in the definition of tangible net worth. Um, tangible net worth means total assets excluding, and the word should be intangible, not tangible. And it's because the way that it's currently wor worded, the tangible net worth would be zero if it's excluded. So we certainly don't mean that. Um, and then on page 45, starting on lines 21 to page 46, line 6, um, we want to amend the net worth requirement to be not less than 500000 or in an amount determined by the commissioner as necessary to ensure the safety and sound operation of the company. And we believe that this would be clearer to the licensee and it would be easier for us to um, supervise. And I would be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. We have testimony from Lynn Higashi, HTDC. Aloha chairs, vice chairs, members of the committee. Um, I, I just want to add, we stand in on our testimony and support, but I do, I do want to add our experience um, partnering with DFI over the past two years uh, on this uh, digital currency innovation lab. lab. Um, it's very appropriate that we're in a consumer protection and economic development joint committee because we believe that moving forward, it is a balance between those two. Um, the industry is very exciting, uh, but it's also very complicated and it's changing. And so uh, there's a lot of consumer education that needs to go on. And we believe that having some form of regulation uh, will be beneficial so that we can uh, find the balance between consumer protection and economic development. Um, so, so while we see different testimony offering different opinions, we believe um, starting, we can start by having the agency in charge and having you know the commissioner regulate this. So we're supporting uh, the proposal from the administration and available for any questions. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Uh, we also have testimony on this matter from Grassroots Institute of Hawaii, Joe Kent. Uh, thanks so much, Chair. Uh, and just a correction, it's Grassroot Institute. Um, uh, but I really appreciate uh, you allowing me to testify today. My name is Joe Kent, and I'm the Executive Vice President of the Grassroot Institute. Um, we think this bill is well intentioned. I'm so glad that um, Commissioner Ikeda had uh, developed this study and, and looked into this matter thoroughly. Um, however, uh, respectfully, we still believe this protects consumers too much. If you um, create a nest of regulations, it's very difficult to out unwind it later on. Um, it's a much better approach would be to um, have a light touch approach and, and then if something is needed, then, um, then act on that. But, uh, but this would levy the very strict regulations um, uh, right at the get-go, and that could hamper the market um, in Hawaii, which has already been um, uh, hurt. Um, a few notes. So this bill um, was derived from model legislation provided by the Conference of Banking, the State Banking Supervisors. Um, and um, so it's, it's model uniform legislation that has not yet been enacted in any state. Um, 
The CSBS legislation does clarify the tangible net worth requirement. Uh, I was glad to hear that uh, Commissioner Ikeda suggested a few uh, additions to the bill, although I can't, <laughs> I wish I could remember exactly what she said at, at the moment, but I believe she said that the net worth requirement would be more clearly defined. Um, I think she said something like not less than 500,000. So I hope you, we could ask her to clarify exactly what that was um, because that is important. Um, and, but the bill does still have a lot of the other confusing issues. Do food establishments need to be uh, licensed? Does Toys R Us need to be licensed if they uh, accept cryptocurrency, for example? Um, do customers need a license? Does the state have to uh, collect surveillance information over customers' finances? Um, these are all important questions and could be dealt with in future years. Uh, so we strongly support a different bill, which would take a light touch approach, just like 20 other states, SB 2697 would align Hawaii with uh, and vault us to one of the best states for cryptocurrency instead of this bill. Thank you. Uh, River Financial Inc. Michael Watkins offered some comments. Uh, Nathan Harmon for Blockchain Solutions Hawaii submitted some late testimony. Uh, the Libertarian Party of Hawaii, Fina Bonoan, uh, testimony in opposition. Sean Cover in opposition, Dara Collins <coughs> in support, Jared Silva doesn't like digital currency, uh, Jeff Sabino offered some comments saying that he uses the blockchain technology, uh, Katie Jackson in opposition, Liam Ball, Liam are you there? Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. All right. Aloha. Um, thanks for, for having this bill on the table. Um, I think the world of cryptocurrency, that whole industry is really exciting and a benefit to Hawaii residents. Um, I did submit written testimony um, because there were, and I, I'm a pleb, I, I live on Maui, so I'm a, I'm a consumer, um, but I'm, I'm a a customer of River Financial, actually, I just saw that they submitted testimony. And I do think um, we we need clear and simple regulation. I just wanted um, to contrast I, the the licensing cost with that of a Hawaii, uh, Hawaii real estate brokerage. So um, I just have a little data here. Uh, for 2021, Hawaii Life real estate brokers um, transacted $3.69 billion worth of real estate deals. And the licensing fee is $486. So just think of, think of that in comparison to these proposed licensing fees for this uh, licensure under the state, which I think would, be, would prevent a lot of innovators from entering the field. So um, I support the intent of this bill. I support the great things that this could bring to the state. I think there are a number of amendments that would be necessary to make this work. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. We have some late testimony from Kevin Teruya in opposition. Is Kevin on the call? If not, Members, are there any questions for Ms. Ikeda or any of the other testifiers that are on the call? I guess I'll ask the question now. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, um, are, you, are you asking Iris? Iris? Right, Iris, please. So, um, I think Mr. Ball also mentioned about the barrier to entry as being the licensing fees, and and I don't, I I'm just relying on one of the testimonies that I read here that it could amount to thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I wanted to just have you clarify whether, whether that's true and where would that put Hawaii in terms of relative to the other states? Yeah, so thanks for that question. So, you know, this, this particular law would be the first one of, it, of its kind in any of the states. So we would be definitely the leaders. 
um, in the crypto licensing space. Um, so um, the license in the bill is $9,000 for the application and the annual licensing fee based on the transactions would be um, somewhere between $10,000 a year to $50,000 a year, and that would be paid quarterly. Um, we heard from companies that they could not pay the annual licensee fees at one time, and so we broke it out into quarters to accommodate, um, you know, a payment schedule. Okay. So, so are, I, are there are there other states that have any kind of licensing fee, or would? If Hawaii adopts a scheme somewhat similar to what's been testified to, we'd be the first and nobody else is in that space at all. Right. We would be the first, um, we would be the first state to have a law like this. Um, as as was pointed out in some of the other testimonies, New York has a bit license, but they haven't been very successful. Wyoming has a big charter. Um, they also have not been successful in chartering a company. Um, so this is a different approach. Um, you know, kind of taking what they, what I've learned from talking with um, the regulators in those two other states, as well as in um, some of the other states that are considering different pieces of legislation. Um, the other states um, that have been mentioned are all using their money transmitter law, um, exempting uh, somewhere between 17 and 20 states exempt virtual currency or digital currency companies from money transmission laws, making that um, uh, no regulation for the digital currency companies. There are about 16 to 18 states that have um, that are silent in their law, but include uh, virtual currency as part of money transmission. And in all of those states, you know, they charge different licensing fees. The highest one is about $7,000. And then the lowest ones are in you know, a couple hundred dollars. Um, and as I said, that's for money transmitters. So refresh our memory. What do we charge for money transmission transmitter license fees? We charge $5,000 for the application and the annual fee is scaled by transactions up to $20,000. Okay. So what you're proposing for um, the digital um currency regulation is not that it's greater than because it's new but it's not that out of line from what we're charging for others right in our opinion it's not um it's not unreasonably high um just because as you said this is new and it takes a lot of um you know training and you know a different thought process as we're looking at the different business models in each of these companies as we've learned in the Digital Currency Innovation Lab, all of these companies use different platforms and we're not regulating any of the platforms. We just want to understand what they are so that we can be assured that they are, that they are providing appropriate consumer protection. Okay. Members, any, any yes. other questions? Right. Senator Sandlin, the first. Yes. Thank you. So Iris, um, I'm a little bit confused as to why you, this is the administration bill when it's modeled after the New York law and you just testified that the New York law um, wasn't that good a regulatory scheme. Um, why aren't we doing what the other 16 to 18 states that just removed digital currency from the money transmitter law and do what I guess grassroots said is you know, doing a light touch rather than a new fashioning it after something that you had testified to was not a good law. Right. So just to clarify what I said, so we took pieces um, from the different laws that didn't work. Um, you know, they, those states are still tweaking their law. Um, but what I did was take pieces of, you know, different laws to create the licensing scheme that you see here. There is a bill to um, exempt money, um, virtual currency companies from the money transmitter law, and that would provide no consumer protections. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have questions? Just one more. Senator um, Ms. Lutra. Thank you. 
Um, so Iris, if you could kindly talk a little bit about the double reserves, because that seems to be something that's like a sticking point to a lot of uh, cryptocurrency exchanges that they oppose it, oppose the admin bill because of that. And is there any uh, way to get around that while yes. still providing um, protection for our consumers? Right. So as, as I said, the, the main focus of the, any of our licensing bills is for consumer protection. And they, um, the, the permissible investments, the double reserves that you're talking about, the way we have it in our in the administration bill, SB 3076, is a one-for-one one based on the, um, the type of digital currency held by the various companies. So, you know, companies are holding Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, you know, and I would say they're holding up to 25 or 30 different types of coins. And that's what they would have to hold in reserves for the customers, not US dollars. Right, but then, like I said, that might be a barrier to entry for some folks who would have to tie up their capital in those reserves. So right. is there a way where that can be mitigated, the risk can be mitigated without having to do double reserves? Yeah, so I'm not sure why people are calling it double reserves because it's only reserved one time mm -hmm. um, with, with the like kind um, digital currency. Um, in the money transmitter bill, or in the money transmitter law, it is a double reserve. You would have to hold the digital currency plus U.S. dollars. So in the money transmitter law, yes, that would be a double reserve. In our current bill, you only reserve it at one time. Could you do capital reserves instead of? So we, so as I said, we we're suggesting a. Uh, um, a clarification to the net worth requirement, which is the capital, um, to from what it is right now to a minimum of five hundred thousand to um, you know whatever the consumer or the commissioner determines is necessary for safe and sound operations. Some of these companies have billions of dollars um, worth of operations, and five hundred thousand is not going to protect too many consumers. Okay, so just so to be clear. How much is are we asking for capital reserves for money remittance companies? So the legislature at that at that time only wanted a thousand dollars. That's a big gap there. Okay, thank you, Iris. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on this measure? If not, members, this brings us to the end of our agenda. So let's take a brief recess and see if we are some decision making. Thank you. We'll call the committee back to order for purposes of decision making. Um, members, the first item on our bill was uh, Senate Bill 3023 relating to real estate brokers. Um, this prohibits uh, real estate brokers and agents licensed from offering to rent, uh, receive remuneration for representing illegal transition, illegal transit vacation units and whole home short term rentals. Um, recommendation is to pass this with amendments, take the Real Estate Commission amendments, including definitions, add a definition of whole home rental as a property of up to six bedrooms located in a residentially zoned district rented for no more than 180 days. Transient vacation unit defined as a condo or cottage rental offered for rent no longer than 30 days, if allowable under ordinance of the county in which the rental unit or home is located and defect the date to 12-31-2050. Any questions or concerns? If not, Chair votes aye. Voting on SB 30-23, um, Chair's recommendation is passed with amendments. Chair votes aye, Vice Chair. Aye. Um, Senator DeCoy. Aye. Senator Nishihara. Aye. Senator Rivera. Aye. Um, I vote aye. Senator Vadella. Aye. Chair, recommendation has been adopted.
Thank you, members. On Senate Bill 20. Oh, wait, EET. EET. Oh, I'm so, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, right, mem we'll members of uh, EET, same recommendation. Any discussion? If not, Senator Misalucha, I vote yes. For Committee on Energy, Economic Development, and Tourism, this is in reference to Senate Bill 3023. Chair recommendation is to pass with amendments. Chair votes aye. Vice Chair Misalucha votes aye. Senator Lee is excused. Senator Revere. Aye. And Senator Revere. Aye. Oh, sorry. So, Senator Favella. I'll take two Aye. votes if you give them thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Favella. Aye. Aye. Chair, with four votes, your uh, recommendations adopted. Thank okay, you. we've got to speed this along. We, yeah. we don't have a lot of time left. Senate Bill 2513 uh, is. Relating to renewable energy, recommendation is to pass with amendments proposed by the Practical Policy Institute, delete burning trees as an acceptable renewable energy generation source, allow flexibility to the PUC to determine what type of RFP meet, best meets the needs that give rise to those uh, future RFPs, remove proposed language from page 6, line 10 to page 7, line 3, which would require separate RFPs for resources divided as firm and intermittent, defect the date to 7-31-2050. Members, any questions? If not, Chair votes aye. Okay, for voting for SB 2513, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. All members being present, are there any reservations other than myself? Reservations. Reservations for Senator Babella. Any nays? Okay. Chair, your recommendation has been adopted. Thank you. Members of the ET, same recommendation. Any discussion? If not, Senator Misalucha, I vote yes. For Senate Bill 2513 for EET committee, for all members present, any reservations? Reservation. Any nays? Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Thank you, members. Senate Bill 3025 relating to digital currency licensing program. Uh, chair recommends that we pass this measure with amendments, use the phased approach set forth in Senate Bill 3076 that allows for an orderly transition from the dig Digital Currency Innovation Lab to the new licensing scheme, insert amendments offered by Blockchain Solutions, add an exclusion to paragraph two uh, saying that non-custodial digital currency business activity by a person using a digital currency acknowledged as legal tender by the U.S. or government recognized by the U.S. or that has been determined not to be a security by a U.S. regulatory agency. Add a clause uh, to paragraph 14e, ownership and control of digital currency stating as follows, unless clearly presented and stated to the client that doing so is the intent of the product, as well as some technical non-substantive amendments recommended by SMA for Senate Bill 3076, which is what we're putting into 3025, and defect the date to 7-2050. Any questions or concerns? Also, we um, have to make it about CFI. Mm -hmm. I just said what we're going to add, okay? All right. Okay, voting on SD 3025, Chair's recommendation is to pass with amendments. All members being present, are there any reservations? Seeing none, are there any nays? Seeing none, Chair recommendation has been adopted. Thank you. For members of EET, same recommendation. Any discussion? If not, Senator Misalucha, I vote yes. For SB 3025, for members of the Committee on Energy, Economic Development, and Tourism, all members present, are there any reservations? Any nays? Chair, your recommendations adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senate Bill 3076, defer indefinitely because we rolled uh, the uh, ideas needed from that bill into 3025. Mm -hmm. And I believe that brings us to the end of our agenda, and we made it in our time frame. Hallelujah! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good rest of your Tuesday. Oh, oh,